Today's forum is sponsored by PNC and by Mike Gonorowski, Regional President of Central Ohio PNC. He will join us on stage later to moderate the audience's questions. The forum is also sponsored by AEP, represented by AEP Chairman Mike Morris. Please join me in thanking our sponsors and welcome Mike Morris to the stage to introduce today's speakers. Thank you very much. It's a joy for us to be here. Uh, American Electric Power has been a supporter of this event for a long, long time. Our Teresa McQueen sits on the board, and we've made contributions in excess of $150,000 just in the last couple of years to make sure that we have an opportunity to bring these kinds of activities for luncheons like this. And of course, it's a double honor for me uh, to be here today to introduce uh, Klaus Kleinfeld. I have the honor of serving on the Alcoa board with Klaus. And I've seen him in action in many, many ways. And I can assure you that you're going to enjoy the comments. And of course, Colleen will lead us in the questions and answers. She needs almost no introduction. There is more material about both of them in your own brochures, uh, brochures so we'll leave it at that. Let me simply say that Alcoa, not only did it create the product aluminum and the industry aluminum, uh, today you've interfaced with Alcoa for sure. In the car that you came here today, uh, many of you probably walked over, but at least you drove into work. Some of you may have flown here. As you know, we do a lot of work with the airline industry. But equally important, if you looked at your iPad or your iPhone uh, housed with aluminum made by Alcoa, if some of you in the younger generation, different from starting with a cup of coffee like me and my colleagues, you probably started with a soda, or as we call it here in the Midwest, pop. That would have been an Alcoa-made can. So we're happy that you interfaced with us, and Klaus, we're sure happy that we make those kinds of uh, ultimate use products for the people of this great country and for folks around the world. Thanks a lot for being here. We very much look forward to the presentation. I'm happy to be here today with you, and um, I was asked to, from format-wise, I mean, this is the first time for me here, so my understanding is that uh, I was asked to give a few remarks at the beginning, and uh, then we'll go into a discussion here on the podium, and then we'll open it up uh, for uh, you all, I mean, to get into a dialogue. So we'll have, I think, ample time to get into this. So why Ohio? <laughs> That's the question. Why Alcoa, Ohio? Because the, we celebrate to this year our 125th anniversary, and, uh, and in fact, the day uh, of the formal founding of what was then called the Alcoa Pittsburgh Reduction Company was yesterday, and we celebrated it uh, in New York by ringing the closing bell. Some of you might have seen us there, you know, watched by, as I understand, by the New York Stock Exchange by more than 350 million people all around the world. So that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, but what's really cool is that uh, it started here, here in Ohio, not exactly here, but it started at Oberlin College, you know, because that's where this kid uh, at the sweet age of 20 called Charles Martin Hall went and uh, he asked a very American and very good question, you know. He asked his professor, this was the time of Industrial Revolution 125 years ago, he came from Pittsburgh, you know, steel was going up, it was exciting, people were leaving their land, going from the farms into the cities, you know, very cool stuff going on, a lot of people got rich and so here's this young ambitious kid and he's asking his chemistry professor, what do I have to do to become the richest man on this planet? <laughs> I mean, don't we all understand this? I, I do. So, 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 and the professor, a very thoughtful man, said, you know what, there is this one material that is so unique in its capabilities. You know, it's lightweight, it's strong, it's easily malleable, but we can't find a way how to manufacture it industrially. And that's why, at that time, it was the most expensive material on this planet, right? And actually, the tip of the Washington Monument is made out of aluminum. And when I asked our historians, you know, how did they do that? They scrapped it in little pieces together because at that time the industrial process did not exist. And it was a symbol to have the monument topped by aluminum of the richness of this nation, right? So here's Charles Martin. And Charles Martin had, was not only smart, was not only ambitious, but he had a wonderful sister, Julia. And Julia, at that time, was also at Oberlin College. And you might say, how is that possible? Because at that time, women were not allowed 
into many of the colleges. And it was only possible because there was a backdoor opening into Oberlin College, basically helping women to learn about philosophy and, and the, the, the weaker things, so to say, and learn how to behave and what have you, you know. So, so she got in there, she was four years uh, his uh, senior, she got in there and what she really did is she sneaked her, her, her way right into chemistry class. And that's what she really took, right? So the, these two paired up and she helped him tremendously to do all the experiments that eventually led to him cracking the code of industrially making aluminum. And they were both in their 20s. What then happened is a fascinating story also. What then happened is the story that they got challenged whether this was really their invention. They got challenged by a European who said, I did it first. And it hadn't, if it hadn't been for the excellent record keeping of Julia, they would have lost that case, right? So this is a fascinating story, and I think that story could happen any time today. Could be as fascinating as it happened 125 years ago. So from that moment on, you know, life changed. Life changed because he finally had, a, had, had cracked the code, but he didn't find anybody who wanted it. So he had to team up with a couple of folks, you know, who helped him to commercialize it. Because the steel guy said, what do we need aluminum for? We don't want it in our shop. So they had to back a kettle maker outside of Pittsburgh to borrow the kettle forms. They wouldn't want the aluminum in their shop to borrow the kettle forms and make the first aluminum kettle, right? And that was the first commercial success. You know? The Wright brothers, at the same time, were experimenting with creating a, an instrument to fly, right? What were they using? What were they using for this? They were using basil wood and textile. Everybody who thought of flight was thinking of basil wood and textile. And usually it didn't go well, you know? <laughs> so you've all seen that. The big and funny enough, the Wright brothers cracked the coat, but the plane was made out of basil, wood, and textile. But they were the first ones to put aluminum on there. But they didn't put it on the wings. They put it on the motor block. Everybody else had steel, and they used aluminum. And that's the reason why their plane didn't tip over. That's why it took off. Because you remember some of the first movies, you know, they see, see these planes hovering, and a you know, and then, you know, not good if you sit in it. <laughs> so, so, so if you want to understand, I mean, what Alcoa stands for, uh, and, and I think a, a, a role that, the, that Ohio has played in that, obviously also we, with the Wright brothers, having living here at the same time looking at that, mankind could fulfill one of the biggest dreams that we always had, flight, you know? And not only leave the, leave the, leave the planet and fly around, but also to, to, um, to go out of space, you know? So this is, this is the connection historically, and, and the connection still lives on. I mean, we have uh, quite a substantial base of manufacturing here. Cleveland is one of our larger plants here in the US. And the biggest things that we do here is all, all basically advanced manufacturing. The largest, one of the largest press on this planet we have here in, 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 in Cleveland, and, uh, and we just renovated it and put about 100 million in there. We've just put another 50 million in, in Barberton. Right? And to build one of the most ecologically friendly and, and also economical uh, new um, caster, cast houses, right? which also works very, very well for the recycling and allows us to do a closed loop. So that's why. That's why I'm here today, because I think there's nothing better in the 125th anniversary to connect back to, uh, to the roots and also to emphasize and tell the story why manufacturing continues to be cool. I would say as cool and probably even cooler you know, than it was 125 years ago, and I hope I can get my message across. The reality is, if you look at the stats today, and there have been some nations and certainly also some states that said, well, you know, manufacturing, why do that? You know, why do we need that? I mean, there's this cool thing about service industries, and we can probably be entirely service industry oriented. But think about the, some of the statistics here for the US. The manufacturing industry alone accounts for 17% of all private sector jobs. 17% of all private sector jobs. 60% of all exports leaving the US made by the manufacturing industry. But the number that continues to knock my shoes off because it's so closely linked to anyone's future. 70% of all private R&D spent is done by the manufacturing industry here in the US. Think about that. I mean, one thing is for sure, we will not win the global battle with low labor cost, right? 
That's impossible, and we wouldn't have a great society, right? We will win it with smarts, right? And a great place like this, with having Ohio State University here, I mean, you understand it all, right? We win it with smarts, but we win it with putting money behind that, and that's a big driver for the manufacturing industry, right? Whenever manufacturing leaves, to say it another way around, you will very soon, you can set the clock of seeing R&D leave after that. That is the scary part of it, right? Now there's good news also. There's good news, I mean, if, if you look at what are the changing dynamics, and we wanna talk more about that. I mean, advanced manufacturing, I think I made the point, plays a role and will play a role, and I hope we can, we can, we can continue to talk about that. Policy can help, and it can also hinder. We have some great examples, and I, as a natural born optimist, I'll, I'll mention a very positive change in policy. We have seen with the big recession starting and the decline of the automotive industry, we have seen that at the same time with the revitalization of industry, the, there has been a new federal law put in place called the CAFE regulation. And the CAFE regulation, what the CAFE regulation does it forces automotive companies to have more fuel efficient cars because it's basically it's called the corporate average fuel efficiency. So it's a legislation that, led, that legislates that the car companies have to come up with more fuel efficient cars. This leads, has a great benefit for all of us. It has a benefit for all of us that we will have to pay less at the gas pump you know, than we had to pay before for getting more mileage. Right? But the way how to get there, and that's why it's important for us and for many others, is the, how do you get to more fuel efficient cars? You get through it by light weighting. This is one big, big driver. This is why we're currently seeing one of the, I would say, once in a lifetime change for our industry here in the US uh, with cars going more light weighting and going more into fuel efficiency. We have now made the second expansion, automotive expansion, uh, in, here in the U.S. in the last basically 12 months. The first one was in Davenport, Iowa, and the second one it was in, in, in Knoxville, Tennessee. But it's changing, and it's changing very, very rapidly to the positive, and we'll all benefit from it in, in, in many, many ways. So that's, that's, that's an interesting one. There's also a question of, okay, if all of this is going so well, do we have to worry about anything? And the answer to that, unfortunately, is yes. Because one of the things that I always hear wherever I go around is what we need jobs. And I've just had a very, very good conversation with, with the governor here, fascinating man, great vision, and also great execution skills. And obviously jobs are, are on everybody's mind. Funny enough, with the manufacturing industry, you have an industry that has about 600,000 open jobs in the US as we speak now. Okay, how's that possible, you know, with an, with an unemployment rate being as high as it is? It's possible because of many factors. The fa main factor here, the main driver here is we have a mismatch between the skills and what the jobs need. And we have to address that. And I assume we have a little bit more time to talk about that. So one of the issues there is also how attractive the manufacturing industry is seen by the parents. A statistic recently came out. You might all still remember this movie when the, when the son asks the father and says, uh, what do you think, which industry do I think I should go into in my life? And the father leans over and says, what? Plastics. Well, that's long gone, you know. And I wish it would be aluminum, <laughs> which would be absolutely much more environmentally friendly, as you all know. And you will by the, by the time we're done here. So, so, so but, but the scary thing is, if, if a son or daughter today comes to their parent and say, well, you know, I'm very much considering to take a job in manufacturing, only 20% of the parents will say this is a good idea. 20% of the parents, you know? So we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot here, you know? 600,000 open, open jobs. We have to address that. Now, the parents are well-meaning. Why do they say that? They say it because their view very often, not having experience in manufacturing industry, is we're talking about a job that's dirty we're talking, and probably unsafe. We're talking about a job that's repetitive and not really requires much intelligence. 
And we're talking about a job that's a dead end, doesn't have many opportunities to move through the ranks and do interesting things, right? And I think that if you look at the realities of manufacturing today, you see that every single one of those prejudices is not true. I mean, when you look at the safety statistics alone for manufacturing, you actually see that the manufacturing industry in total is substantially safer than the retail industry. When you look inside of the manufacturing industry, you look around and say, look at Alcoa inside of the manufacturing industry, we're more than four times as safe as any uh, other industrial manufacturing job because safety is at the forefront. When you look at the second point, the repetitiveness, repetitiveness of, of things, the, the, what do jobs require? The jobs are, many of the jobs uh, are not repetitive anymore at all. The, with, with automization that has come in, many of the jobs require that you understand how a computer works, that you know how to program a machine, and you operate big machinery, right? So this is the new realities. Dirty, I mean, you come into our plant, and if the plant is dirty, you will not see the plant manager around for another day. That I can guarantee you. That I can, and we are in some environments where there's a lot of, I mean, um, kind of oil fox created all the day when you have a big rolling mill, you know, you have that, but you will not see any single one of our plant that is dirty. We consider this, this important for the quality. You know, because you wouldn't, you wouldn't go into a kitchen where there's dirt and eat from that. You know, it's a question of, of the professionalism of under, having everybody understand we are a quality shop. We want to have any day we want to show and be proud of showing the place to our customers and the customers understanding, you know, that what we do is the highest quality. We recently had an astronaut coming through. We showed him, we showed him how, how we make the sheet that, that, that his, uh, air, air, air aircraft was built off. He later on spoke to the employees and he said, look, I mean, now that I see this and I understand the quality standards that you apply here, it takes a lot of anger away. I wish I had done that before, you know, because when you sit there and when the countdown happens, you actually are, you have no influence anymore. It's all about the gear around you. It's all about the precision of people, how they have worked together and how precise they've done it. And you know that some missions did not have a happy ending. This was going through my mind when the countdown happened. Right? And I have a family and I wanted to come back. Seeing that you have that same attitude here, that you care, that, and that you really, really show me quality. You know? this, uh, this is, this is what, what, what he said to our employees, and I think, I think he was absolutely right. So with that, let me finish on that note, because we have enough, I think, substance to talk about, right? Okay, so with that, I think I'll walk over to that chair and then you can shoot at me. <laughs> well, I am news-based, so my okay. first question is, give us details about your conversation with the governor today. <laughs> <laughs> and will it result in any jobs in Ohio? <laughs> uh, okay. The governor has an interest in many fields, so, uh, so, and one of the reasons why I was a little bit late is because uh, he, we went to very local uh, questions around uh, what are we investing here, how, we, how do certain investments do, was very interested in the Barberton expansion that we've, we've got just conducted. We talked about his vision uh, and, and our vision on education, I mean, I'm very convinced that I'm very convinced that the structure that eventually has evolved here to have a rigid K-12 and college is not the right structure, uh, not the right structure for the individuals and certainly not for society, that we have to be more flexible even from K-12. to uh, I've just, we ha had on Monday, we had what we call a service-on in Pittsburgh, so we have an 750 of our employees. In do I go in and out or do I just feel I'm going in and out? I'm going in and out. Okay, I was wondering, okay, what's in that iced tea? So, <laughs> so, so, so uh, we just had the, what, we, what we call a service on and we had more than 40 projects where volunteers went in Pittsburgh and I went, I spent the whole day there and also went to two schools. One was a, a charter school in one of the poorest districts in Pittsburgh and another one 
were 10 selected eighth graders that we brought to our uh, super bright, I mean, math and science kids that we brought to our tech center outside of Pittsburgh. And you couldn't have more extremes there. And so we talked about education a lot, you know, and we talked also about some international things that he seems to be very interested in. <laughs> well, you, you mentioned changing the parental mindset on manufacturing jobs. Yes. So I'm from the Pittsburgh area. I grew up, my father was an electrician in a, in a glass factory. I grew up around the mills and mines, and the mindset I have is just what you were saying, that I wouldn't have encouraged my children to go into manufacturing. So how, how do you change the perception, mm -hmm. not just of parents, but of educators who are basically steering children and telling them success comes with a degree at the end of your name? I think there's thousand ways how to do it, and I don't believe there's just one road. I mean, it's like a bouquet of flowers. I give you some that work that we that we are doing and that work very well. We have in one of our facilities uh, in uh, this time it's in Whitehall, Michigan, right? Uh, we have a large facility there, and for now 11 years we have a summer program, um, and we invite every summer two classes, each one around 40 to 50 girls. And typically, they are in seventh to eighth grade. And we invite them for a program that lasts about, I think, three weeks or so. So we bring them to the facility. We show them the facility. That's the first thing. Because when you see it with your own eyes, I mean, they come in. They don't know what's behind these big buildings and walls and fences, you know. We show that to them. That's the first thing, which already breaks their pattern, right? They go back home and tell the parents, this is the most clean place that I can think of, you know. Our house is not as clean as that place is. <laughs> I, I tell you, they would say that uh, because it's true, you know. You've seen the, our houses. Apparently. Now I have. I, 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 I'm assuming that uh, I mean that houses that have children sometimes have a little disruption <laughs> from own experience, you know. Not that I like it, but that's uh, so. So so that's the first thing. Then we do some um, teaching. Our own employees, I mean, teach them and show them what's going on there, and they show them. The, the in, they give them an interest in why is it important to have an interest in, in science and math. Applied, right? Where does that matter? We've tracked with these girls what happens to them after they leave school. Almost 70% of them go to college, right? 65% out of those that go to college choose a STEM education path. I am dead convinced. We didn't run it as an experiment, but I'm, these are girls, right? I'm dead convinced that that would not have happened if we wouldn't have that program, right? So, I mean, that's one way to do it. We have another program, and, and these are, again, I mean, designed by, by the, the local communities. We have another program which, if you want to go out of the school environment and you want to go more into <coughs> the kind of higher education environment, almost all of our facilities here in the U.S. have a cooperation program with a local community college. And very interesting what we've experienced there. We obviously don't have teaching facilities in our places, right? When we, whenever we reached out to, to the community college and told them, look, I mean, we can't find the people, machine operators, modern machine operators, or numeric control uh, handlers, we, we don't have that. Uh, can you train that? The com community college very often says, we don't have a course for that. We'd say, well, look, would you be interested in having a course? Let, let, we can help you design the course. We can tell you what exactly we need. We can even send you some of the people that we have that can train that. We don't have the facility, let's do that together. The openness, there has not been one community college that turned us down. In fact, the model there that works very well is that it's, a, it's, a, it's a really a partnership where we help them design the curriculum in such a way that whoever goes in there has a higher chance of employability, right? And very often this program comes together with us saying, okay, our employees can, can sign up with courses, evening or weekend courses, we pay for them. And those courses, depending on what, how big the subject is, take up to two to three years. It's a big commitment, time commitment for them, right? So we pay for them, and almost everybody who comes back gets a promotion. Right? They do it while, while they are working. Very often they get a promotion already while they are in the, while they are in the process, you know? You want some more examples? I can go on, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> seriously, I mean. <laughs> ask you this, you mentioned the innovation and the historical innovation, innovative path that Alcoa took. But as, as you look forward to this 21st century, how do you keep that innovative spirit alive? And mm. where, you know, what direction do you see Alcoa going as you move forward? Yes, 
That's a very good question. I mean, we traditionally are, ha we have two big buckets, so to say, in mm -hmm. our, our portfolio. One is we make the aluminum, which is a commodity. I mean, it gets traded every nanosecond, and there is a world market price that gets set, you know, more often than not by people who never want to own aluminum because the financial world is a determinant of that. You know, that's unfortunately the way life is. So there, what we do there is we move very, we work very hard on coming down on the cost curve, the worldwide cost curve, because there the only thing that guarantees our success is being the lowest cost producer, right? So this is, this is the pretty daunting task there. So we are closing high cost facilities, we're building lower cost facilities. That's what happens there. The second part is the value add part, and that's the part where we can innovate a lot on, on the product side. You know, talked about automotive, aerospace, uh, Mike talked about packaging, you know, and consumer electronics, we didn't talk about. Many here have iPads, you know, and you know the back plane of the iPad is all aluminum, you know, and uh, so. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think, <laughs> I, 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 I think thank you to Steve Jobs and his great vision, and I think he realized how much he could get with this, this aluminum there. So we now have, uh, we built this out. We are growing very, very substantially in, the, in what we call the value add business. This now makes 57% of our revenues and almost 80% of our profits. You know, so you can, you can get a feel for how important innovation is for the future of us. And we are accelerating the innovation. We are bringing new products out faster, you know, just to make sure that uh, we continue to stay competitive, right? You know, you, Alcoa, of course, is seeing great success. But the U.S. manufacturing, the perception of U.S. manufacturing and the labor costs here and the, the gradual shift that we've seen to, towards service industry you know, how, how do you switch that pendulum back? Or do we, do we need to switch the pendulum back? Well, I gave you this one statistic, 70%. I mean, if you only want to keep one statistic that I, you all make up your mind yourself, I mean, on this, I think it's self-convincing. 70% of all research and development money spent in the U.S. is spent by the manufacturing industry, right? And, okay, you know, if we want to be a knowledge society, right, we better have R&D and apply it, because otherwise, you know, the service, service industry is by definition not transportable, right? Service, def, ser, you, you, I mean, if you wanna, if you wanna be, be successful as, as a, a global player and want to export things, well, the service industry is very hard to export. It's almost impossible to export, right? When you have products and you can make competitive products, you can become much, much more, the battery. <laughs> okay, no manual. Redundant. Okay. 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 Okay, it's back, I guess. So, <laughs> so, so that's, I think that's, that, that would be, uh, would be, um, I think, a very um, short sighted, short sighted view if we w wouldn't make sure that there is a future in manufacturing. And in fact, your, your, your aspect on the labor cost side. Labor cost side very often is not the highest cost aspect. I mean, labor cost has more, is more a question of not, let's not go totally crazy and drive it, drive it to insanity, which we sometimes unfortunately do. But as a cost block in most of the manufacturing industry, it's not a, not a big cost driver. We talked about Governor Kasich and your, your um, obviously you try to have good relationship with the, with the state governments, wherever yes. you have facilities. Can you describe to us your relationship with the Obama administration? I understand you're on a new committee that appointed by the president. Yeah. You know, how is that working for you? And do you think that uh, manufacturing is getting the support it needs from Washington? I think the, that Washington has uh, and the administration have discovered in the last, uh, uh, whatever, m years, you know, that ma manufacturing has a chance for revitalization for a whole host of reasons and the importance of it in a healthy mix uh, in the economy and, and therefore have put together this advanced manufacturing um, industry group uh, which uh, has just uh, been announced to go into a second round. I think they call it advanced manufacturing 2.0, right? And uh, I'm happy to serve there because I think it's the, it's the right cause. It's the right cause for, for the country and we are in the middle of it. We have a, a number of very good practices that we are willing to share with others, you know. It, and in the end, it all has to happen on the local level. I don't, I don't, I mean, there are a few things where one would need, I mean, big government, certainly, I mean, some of the frame conditions could, could, could help, you know, but a lot of things can happen on the local level. Alcoa has a global footprint. Mm -hmm. How is not only Alcoa, but U.S. manufacturing perceived in other countries in your experience? Uh, 
I, I don't I don't think that people think that way. I mean, uh, I mean, people think they buy the best product. You know, they really don't care where it's coming from. You know. So I mean, I, I mean, they, they they used to buy Cadillac. I still remember when I grew up in Germany. You know that everybody was bragging. I mean, if there were was somebody who owned a Cadillac, you was you were basically pilgrimaging there, wanting to see this beautiful American car and said, "This is the best." You know, today this is kind of like when you have a Maybach showing up in your neighborhood. You know, so how did that happen? You know, <laughs> it wasn't because there were more people living there. As you as you look around this room, obviously you've got a, a captive audience here. People who are really are you are you stunned when you go around the country, the people who are engaged in the problems that are facing manufacturing. I mean, we look at AEP and some of the environmental issues that they've been facing in the past few years, and we look at our waning coal industry. Uh, are are people as engaged as you want them to be? Uh, I think you you can, can almost not max out on engagement. You cannot max out on engagement, and I, we 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 encourage all of our employees to uh, to give back to the community to personally get engaged. Uh, I think a democracy can only exist if the societal structures mix, and unfortunately, something very odd has happened, which I certainly did not foresee. One would think, with the uh, coming of the communication age, that it would be much easier inside of the society to communicate, but. What has happened in reality is that it makes it easier to stratify societies, right? You see today that uh, before, I mean, and you see it in almost all areas. You see it through stratification in, in neighborhoods. You know, you see it. You see it in school districts. You see it in voting districts. You see it in who communicates with who, right? You can live, and and the technology is actually enforcing that. You can live in your little bubble without ever being confronted with a counter argument, right? I mean, you see it in your industry. I mean, your industry, I mean, the media industry has been affected big time. And, and when you see today that uh, an article is, is uh, altered, you know, depending on what audience you have, because the knowledge of, if you do it online, the, the knowledge of what you read, you know, and the, uh, alter the article, you know, uh, basically, uh, I think that's a very dangerous tendency, you know, because it goes, goes, it takes the basics away from how democracy works. I'm a big believer in democracy, so I'm a little scared about that. What we also see is people have a tendency to seek out online and to seek out the voice that agrees with their totally own. They, totally they do, and technology helps them do that. And it, it, it helps people isolate their arguments Absolutely. and their opinions. Absolutely. Now, I understand that you're going to Ohio State University mm -hmm. later today. Uh, you mentioned that it's, uh, it, it's central to the success of, of Columbus, of Central Ohio, the fact that we've, you know, we've gotten through the recession much better than other parts of the state, as well as Mattel that's here. So when you go into uh, institutions like Ohio State University, what are you trying to do when you're there? And what are, are you trying to connect with, mm -hmm. with those, those future R&D specialists? Yeah. Or are you asking them for support? You know, what will you be doing at Ohio State? So I will specifically be, we have a cooperation with Ohio State. So what I will be doing is I will listen to two, three projects this afternoon uh, th that uh, students and their faculty have been undertaking. All of them are in the more environmental friendly area. I mean, some in how, the, how, do you, can, you, how can you increase the light weighting in cars and, and other sustainability. So there are three specific projects, and the students and the faculty will present the results to me. So, so they have worked on it, so I will get a feel for how deep is this. And have a, we have a dialogue over some really substantive technology uh, things there. I think it helps them uh, to find a way to apply it, to apply their knowledge. And I hope that the interaction with me gives them also, encourages them to continue on that path. I mean, um, so, and obviously we use it as, as a recruiting event. I, mean, I wouldn't be here if I wouldn't hope that some of the best employers will sign up to come to Alcoa. I mean, that's natural, <laughs> because I believe that the only sustainable competitive advantage that any company has is talent, you know, like a country, you know. It's, Talent. You mentioned uh, that you have training specifically for girls at one of at least yes. one of mm -hmm. your facility for young women, and I have talked to engineering women at Ohio State University mm -hmm. who have a great concern that they don't think our high schools are encouraging young women to go into those core STEM courses, and that uh, you know it wasn't that long ago when when uh, women were in fact discouraged from totally. going into those to those classes. Julia Hall. Um, yeah. <laughs> that people were told, and, and there, there's a woman who I know here who told me that she wanted to take calculus in her senior year of high school, and her, her father was told that she couldn't do that because they only had so many seats. Yeah. She would end up married, 
and the calculus seat was going to be saved for the boys in her class. So you've got parental perception problems, and you've got, to a certain extent, young women have the perception themselves. How, what are you doing to encourage a turnaround and encourage women to go into those core classes? Well, I gave you uh, one example already, but as I said, it's a flower bouquet. I mean, it's not one thing, it's a couple of things. I mean, one of the things that we recently did, which we are very proud of, we actually won the Catalyst Award. Catalyst is pr probably the most renowned organization for bringing more women into the workforce, right? And, um, and this is a global program run here, 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 here from the U.S. And, and um, a couple of years ago, five years ago, Mike, I mean, the, we got together, the board got together, and we had, we have, once a year we have what we call a talent development session with the board, where we go through name by name um, people, and we talk about this, and, and, and we have a really a great board, and I would say that even, Mike, if you weren't, weren't here, and I, I, hope you, I, I, hope you, I hope you agree with me, I, I, because we have a super diverse board. We got three women on our board, you know, and very international representation, and so it's a great discussion. So in this, I, I, I will never forget that. In this, we all got around and we said, this is all good, we like it, but then we looked at the diversity statistics, and pretty much everybody in the room believes in diversity, right? And we said, we are not moving the needle. We're just not moving the needle. And it's not because every single one who came in from our executive sang the same song, they all said the right things, you know, but we, we measure everything, you know, and because we believe what doesn't get measured doesn't get done. We didn't move the needle. So we said, look, this has to stop. So what moves the needle? So we went back to the origin of Alcoa and said, Charles Martin Hall's question, how do I become the richest man on this planet? And we said, we're going to put some extra money on the table to break this pattern. So we're going we're gonna to give, I think we said at that point in time, 10% extra bonus. You know, if we put very, very critical diversity measures in place, and if you make those, you get a 10% extra bonus just to move the needle, right? So, and you know the answer to that? First year, we moved the needle. Can you believe this? So, <laughs> So I, I can. I mean, I can. But you know, so so we said this works. So let's let's keep that in place, but have a higher target. It works, you know. And then and then we put together this program, which we call Women in Hard Hats, because in our industry, I mean, if you look at the this was the the excuse. Our industry, you know, it's not only manufacturing, but on top of it is a lot of it is tough manufacturing. So you'd say, no way, you're going to have women representation. So we can never get higher than what you see entering into, into colleges. So this was our big time excuse. And we said, no, that's not going not to work. We're going to bring it up higher. And uh, as I said, this year we won the Catalyst Award for what we did there and had a lot of women there in hard hats, you know, from all around the world. And uh, I think by now, I, I would say by now it's a movement because because before, you know, all these classical prejudices, you know, can they really run a plan? We have a woman running our Iceland plant. <laughs> Iceland smelt her, Janem. Don't mess around with her, you know? <laughs> I tell you, don't mess around with Janem, you know? So, so, so Janem, Janem just, we are building a, 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 a big complex in Saudi Arabia uh, because it's lowest cost there, you know, because of the cheap, cheap gas, basically gas for free that we have there. So. Uh, she just had about a hundred Saudis uh, that have never worked in an industrial environment being shipped up to Iceland to get their training in Iceland. I mean, these are Saudi men that have never s seen women that are not veiled, you know, and where we ship them there in winter, you know, so, so that, 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 that it, would be a little, that we, it would be a little bit colder, you know, so cooling the temper down, but I tell you, I mean... And there are the, the today. I mean, today you see that I I, I I feel that you inside of the top leadership and the next levels. I mean, people uh, have really seen how this can work and would not want to miss that part of the culture. You know, I'm, I'm about done. I have time for one more question. <laughs> so I want to ask you. You know, as you look forward to not just uh, Alcoa but manufacturing in the future, what at this point in time is your greatest concern, your biggest fear about? you know, innovation and moving forward? Talent. Talent is my biggest fear. We need to win this war. I mean, this is one of the most brutal wars that goes on around the world. Uh, and, and the war will only be won if you have the best, in, you have to have the, the best talent in your place. And it has to be global talent. And this talent has to be, has, has to have the capability to work together as a team. I mean, one of my life's mantras is nobody is perfect, but a team can be. And if you get excellent people 
that are not just single performers but know how to work with others, you can win any war. I'm that convinced and I've been fortunate to see that quite often in my life. Well, I, I want you all to know that before we started this question and answer period when he sat down, he said, ask me any question. So <laughs> I think we are about to have uh, someone come forward who's going to moderate and allow you to ask him any question. Colleen, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mike Gonzorowski with uh, PNC Bank. Uh, as you know, long supporters of CMC, we're delighted to co-sponsor with our great client AEP and also our great client Alcoa. Uh, we, we enjoy the business relationships with both those great firms. And uh, to add to the theme about manufacturing, you know, manufacturers consume a lot of capital, and we love providing capital to manufacturers. <laughs> so if you want to get an edge on that bank loan, come and see us if you're a manufacturer, by the way, or anything else. Money, money remains on sale. Uh, with that, uh, it, as you know, it's a tradition for questions. This uh, is being broadcast on Columbus TV, the Ohio Channel broadcast on WOSU, and viewing on YouTube through a link on the CMC's website. And I see we have people at the microphone, no editorials, just questions. Please go ahead, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Kleinfeld. Uh, thank you for your comments. Congratulations on your anniversary. I'm Jim Rutledge from the law firm of Bricker and Eckler. I'd very much appreciate your comments on your competitive landscape uh, regarding the production of aluminum. Uh, how do you meet the challenges of the competitive landscape, especially uh, with uh, respect to foreign production of aluminum? Well, uh, you, when you look at the, I mean, when you look at the aluminum industry, the upstream part, which I guess you were referring to, not the value add part, right? right? So then you really have to distinguish between mining. We, are, we have our own bauxite mines. We have nine refineries around the world. We have 22 smelters around the world. And then we, have, we own some power assets. So this is what, what is the composition of this. You know? And to be successful in any single one of those requires different things. I mean, we have some of the best, the worldwide's best mines for bauxite. And, and, and obviously, they are not here in the US. You know? because in the U.S. bauxite mining has died out long, long time ago, right? So all, we are very successful in that, very competitive. Some of the lowest cost, best quality bauxite that we have comes from Australia, comes from Brazil, you know, and uh, just great. Then we go on to refining. And refining something very fascinating has happened in the last years here in the U.S. We have one refinery out of the nine, one refinery here in the U.S., which is in Point Comfort, Texas. It used to be the most expensive one that we have in our system. It's run on natural gas, and we use it as what we call a swing plant. So whenever the price was high, we ran it, and whenever the, place, the price was low, we tried to temper it down, right? And today we run it full out because the price of natural gas through shale gas has come down so substantially that it's one of the lowest costs in our system, right? So, and, and our total system is already very, very good on the cost curve. We are in the, in the low, lowest, quart, lowest quartile there. When it comes to smelting, uh, because we have 22 smelters, we are pretty much on the average of the cost curve. So, so that's rougher and tougher, and therefore we have curtailed quite a number of plants in the last years, also with the metal price where it is, as low as it is. It has come down more than 40% uh, since the start of this recession, right? So, so uh, we are, we've currently curtailed about 16% of our capacity, and we are going through review to curtail more, which we have to do, right? At the same time, at the same time, we're looking at opportunities uh, like in Saudi, you know, where we can, where we are currently building the lowest cost smelter on this planet, and starting to ramp it up. And the reason for that is because the the price of of, uh, of electricity there is, is so cheap that uh, I mean, and it adds up to about one third to forty percent of the cost. This is all. This is all method, method to the madness there. <laughs> Thank you. My pleasure. I'm Scott Whitlock, a member of the Columbus Metropolitan Club. A little over 60 years ago, the first, I think, major aluminum reduction plant came to Ohio uh, because of and during the Korean War. The basic recipe uh, was, of course, four pounds of bauxite ore, high quality, get you a pound of aluminum. But to generate the electricity took eight pounds of coal. The raw, that was the raw material for aluminum and still is for aluminum made in Ohio. Given the EPA's rules on coal uh, and electricity generated from coal, does basic aluminum making have any future in Ohio 
or indeed in the United States? Well, let me start with the second part. The answer, does basic aluminum making have a future in the United States? The answer is yes, and it depends on where you are. Um, so let me also give you another statistic uh, that for us, about two-thirds of the energy that we use for aluminum smelting is hydropower. So it's the cleanest that you can get, right? And that's actually also how uh, Charles Martin started. I mean, he started with, with uh, hydropowered uh, smelters. That makes a lot of sense, actually, right? So, so now, and we have been, over the last years, uh, signing contracts for some of our U.S. smelters um, given the change that's going on here in the, in the, on the energy side that make these smelters competitive and they will have a chance for the future. Please. Hello there. Uh, my name is Kimberly Gibson. I work with EWI here in Columbus, Ohio, and uh, we're an engineering services company and we do innovation, insert innovation in manufacturing, and thank you for being a, a longtime member. Uh, we work with your, your uh, engineers all over the world. Um, my question is, um, you talked about moving the needle. And this community, and as many other communities around the United States, is at a moment in which our educational system is being rethought. And the way we educate people from you know, P through 20 uh, is being rethought. And um, I wondered if you could take that wonderful CEO, Precision Like Mind, and give us a few tips on how we um, move the needle on educating people to go into advanced careers in manufacturing and uh, start that much earlier in the process. Yeah, if I, if I want to condense it to, uh, to, to one answer, I think that more flexibility is better because I think we've gotten too rigid on this. I mean, as I said early on, I mean, we kind of feel that everybody who hasn't gone through K-12 and, and college is a dropout, right? Society basically, I mean, basically coins them as dropouts, and we, ha we have to turn that wheel back. This is not how America grew up. When you read, I mean, many of the colleges weren't full-fledged colleges. They were evening courses, you know, weekends and those type of things. There was much, much more occupational training there. Uh, I, I personally think that there's thousands of ways. I mean, how can you train? I've seen it in my upbringing. I mean, in some of my friends who became auto mechanics, you know? And what's the dropout age? I mean, when the hormones start flying, you know? Uh, because then suddenly boys become very focused, you know, uh, and it's very hard to keep them in a math class, you know. So, 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 I mean, can you teach somebody math when a uh, boy math when they are 15 and 16 with real fun? Very hard to do, very hard to do, unless you do two things. You either give them a vision, as you do one thing, you give them a vision what this is good for. For one, for one boy, this is like it was for me, my father, who was an aerospace engineer, you know, dropped into my hand a, a piece of aluminum, right? And I was expecting, you know, because I had never had seen it before, you know, I was expecting that this is heavy, you know, when I was eight years old, you know, heavy, and it dropped in my hands and I could hold it, you know? And for him it was not a normal piece. It was, for him it meant I can build airplanes. This was after the Second World War, the aerospace industry was just getting rebuilt in Europe, and he was one of the first doing that. So this was the moment for me, you know, that was hugely motivational, you know. For other kids, it is basically getting out of school when they are 16 and working in a mechanic shop, you know, and, and redoing cars and learning that the modern motor, to tune the motor, you need to understand today a computer. You know, now, you know, oh, you know what, I have that old car in my garage. I want this to sound really cool when I pick up that girl, you know. And, and, and to do this, I need to learn how to bloody make this computer work, you know. And now I understand this curve, you know, which happens to be a sinus curve or a cosinus curve. How does that thing work? You know, I want to learn that. But motivation is obviously a very different one. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for one more question, please. Good afternoon, Mr. Kleinfeld. My name is Trish Demeter. I'm with the Ohio Environmental Council. We're a nonprofit environmental advocacy organization. And um, the two, two previous questions touched on something I want to ask you about, which is energy and the importance of energy in manufacturing and spe specifically energy efficiency. Um, I'm familiar with Alcoa's commitment to sustainability goals, and I'm really um, you know, excited to see that, that the um, company has embraced energy efficiency as a way to be more competitive and also to attain sustainability goals. 
But right now in Ohio, we're um, in, a, in a middle of a big debate over the value of energy efficiency. And in fact, today at the State House, um, I'll be testifying on legislation that proposes to make some significant rollbacks to Ohio's commitment to energy efficiency investments. Um, last week, there was a uh, business association of which that, yes, I do, I do. Um, there was a characterization of Alcoa's position um, for this legislation to be enthusiastically supportive. So I'm just curious how that squares. I know you don't probably know about state legislation too much, but can you talk a little bit about your company's commitment to energy efficiency? Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I, that you already said that our, our company's commitment to energy efficiency is gigantically high. We actually have this as part of our incentive system also. I mean, the C CO2 reduction is one of one of the things that, that, that we incentivize senior management for, and we've been very, very good. I actually don't have the latest number here, but I would say that we've reduced our CO2 uh, impact while we have been increasing production, you know, by more than 30 percent in the last 10 years, you know, and, and most likely the real number is even higher than that, right? Uh, so we continue to work on that. On the energy efficiency thing, um, I think there, my, my view on this is, in the whole debate around, around CO2, whether you believe in climate change or not, right, you, you have to look at the CO2 impact and the economic impact. Because in the end, if you go for something that is economically very, very expensive, you know, it's great to go after it, but you will run out of money, you know. And, and the impact, you, even though it was a great idea, you will not get it. Therefore, about four or five years ago, the McKinsey Global Institute did an enormously great task to mankind. They cracked, they cracked these two dimensions, and they did a very, very good study. In case you have, do not have that, I would highly recommend to, to take a look at that and distribute it to all of the lawmakers. They cracked this code in, in a study that's called a CO2 abatement study. And they looked at all, really, literally all approaches that exist today, all technologies that exist today that lead to a CO2 reduction, and the cost of it to society, not just the primary, but secondary, tertiary cost to it. And the interesting thing is in that is that it provides exactly the right kind of knowledge for a good debate. Because the, you, you can sort out some things that you know look good on paper but are just not working. You can't afford it. But there are some things that you can afford and that actually pay off very, very quickly. When you look about building codes, energy efficiency, so energy efficiency is a big word. So you've got you to break it down to more specifics. When you look at, for instance, energy efficiency around buildings, right, has a huge quick pay, payback, huge one, you know. So uh, what I would encourage every lawmaker to look into this and, and encourage more people to go after this. And there's a whole host of things that you can do from be better seeding off buildings, you know, to having thermostats and these type of, these type of things, you know, having a, a more, more transparency on what, co what, what eats as much energy, you know. Commercial transportation, to change commercial transportation and have legislation for inner city centers, for instance, you know, that only cars are allowed into inner city centers that, uh, uh, that obey certain higher, higher uh, uh, energy uh, emission standards, you know. Huge impact, highly financeable, you know. These are things I think that I would look at because otherwise the debate becomes an entirely ideologic debate which is absolutely not, not useful, you know, and, and a waste of time. And, you know where that ends, as we currently observe. Thank you for your question. Yeah. I, I hope you enjoyed today's forum. Remember that you can see it again and share it via YouTube on our link at CMC website. We also encourage you to continue the conversation in the lobby over coffee and cookies. If you'd like to be added to our email blast, just put your business card in your plastic sleeve and your name badge before you uh, drop it in the basket. Please be sure to reserve your res to put place your reservation for our next forum. Once more, thank our sponsors AEP and PNC. <laughs> and let's also thank our speakers, Klaus Kleifeld and also Colleen Marshall. <laughs>